So I want you to think for a moment, I want you to think back to a time when you got an insight that you could do what you do even better than you are presently. Then I want you to think, how would you get that insight? I believe the two ways we most get those insights is one, by results. We make a mistake or we fail. And the other one is through feedback. Some caring person says, excuse me, would you like some feedback? <laughs> now, would you agree we usually find out through less than nice ways? Yeah. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about life lessons learned the hard way. <laughs> and what I hope in my short presentation that I could potentially save you a hard way. 30 years ago, I was working for a, a training company by the name of Context International. And I worked with people one-on-one. -on -one. I enjoyed my job. And one day, my boss came into me and said he wanted me to start doing public presentations, public sales presentations. I almost quit. I am, I am a classic introvert. And the last place I would ever picture myself is to be on stage. So I remember my first presentation, as it was yesterday, I stepped up on that stage, and I was so nervous you could hear the change in my pockets. <laughs> the reason I know that is somebody sitting in the second row said out loud, what's that noise? <laughs> and the man sitting next to him said out loud, I think that's the change in his pockets. <laughs> when I finished my presentation, a man walked up to me and said, not everyone's meant to be a public speaker. <laughs> so I had my results and my feedback. I was devastated. Uh, I went with coworkers to a bar right afterwards, commiserating. I, I was just felt so bad. And in the middle of this conversation, there's a woman sitting about 10 feet over from me, and she came over to my table. And she said, would you like some feedback? I said, sure. <laughs> she said, <clears throat> in listening to you, I think your problem is you were affirming a negative. You kept saying, I shouldn't be nervous, I shouldn't be nervous. She said, what you need to do is to affirm the positive. I said, OK, I've got the secret. <sighs> so from before my next presentation, be calm, be calm. <laughs> At the top of my notes, in big red letters, be calm. <laughs> I stood up in front of that next group and shook and babbled through my entire presentation. <laughs> How many of you have been so raw that you didn't want to be around anybody? You isolated. That's what I did. I went home. I just beat myself to a pulp. And in the middle of that, a voice popped in my head and said, you're a nervous person. I think, well, duh. <laughs> but in that moment, I got a life lesson. I believe any strategy you build on fantasy will fail. Or as Susan Scott put it in her book, Fierce Conversations, no plan survives its collision with reality. So my first life lesson was to embrace reality. <laughs> I think we need that foundation of reality in order to be effective. Many years ago, I was on a vacation. I was talking with this older gentleman. He was talking about all the trips he's been on. I was talking about all the ones I've been on. And at one point, he said, what do you think the most important part of taking a trip is? And I said, I think you ought to know where you're going. I think that's real important. He said, nope, you're wrong. <laughs> I said, what is it? He said, you got to know where you're at. He said, no matter how, no matter how good your map is, you know where you're at, you are lost. See, we need that foundation to be effective. And I think the foundation, when we don't set up, is where we create most of our problems. Just like, let's say I wake up one morning, and I'm in a stainless steel room. This doesn't happen to me a lot. <clears throat> stainless steel walls, stainless steel ceilings, solid stainless steel floor. <clears throat> wake up a little bit more, and I notice there's a sign on the wall with a little light above it that starts to blink. So I'll go read that sign. It says, when this light blinks, 30 seconds later, these walls will move together and touch. You know, like in the spy movies, the <laughs> So I wake up a little bit more, and I, I look around, and I notice there are two holes that are cut into the floor, both lined with stainless steel, both large enough for me to fit in, both labeled eight feet deep. 
One is filled to the very rim. One is filled to the only, only the four foot mark. And what they have in them is sewage. Less than nice things are in these holes. So all of a sudden, these walls start. Now, do I have a choice I can make at this moment? Yeah, so I'm going to stand up here and become extremely thin <laughs> or pick a hole. My next choice, a very logical choice, I'm picking four foot. So all of a sudden, these walls start. Now I'm sealed in a stainless steel, a stainless steel cylinder with four foot of sewage. Not one of my better days. Now I want you to think, what choice do I have now? I can stand or sit, pound on the walls, look for an escape hatch, add to it or not. <laughs> but I believe at that moment, I have the ultimate choice. I can stand up and go, ick, ick, this is the uh, nastiest situation I've ever been in. Why is it always me? Ick, ick, oh. Or I can say, thank God it's only up to here. <laughs> and I think what happens in that place, and please don't hear me say that you should say, oh boy, Cess. I think that's a little weird. <laughs> so <clears throat> we have the foundation of reality. I think we need that to be effective. I think the problem is, what we do is we compare that with a preferred reality or fantasy. I was comparing nervous me first time to great speakers I'd seen for years. Not a fair comparison. The same way, I think we compare our real bodies with some body we saw in a magazine that was probably airbrushed. We compare our real relationships with a fantasy one we read about in a romance novel. And I think this is the foundation for all of what we call dissatisfaction, unfair comparison. So I think the challenge is one is to embrace reality, and the second part is to find a context, a working context for that reality. Another life lesson I had that connected to this one, I was 18 years old. I was on a riverboat in the Mekong Delta during the Vietnam War. I was in a very extreme situation, but I'll bet every one of you in this audience have had that exact same insight. How many have ever seen two people in the exact same situation? One was destroyed by it, the other one was strengthened by it. My insight at 18 is it's not about reality. <laughs> it's about perception of reality. So that is... The second lesson is find a working context. See, whatever my context is, what I tend to do is I will gather evidence to prove that. Just how many have ever worked with somebody that's evil, nasty, and bad? How many have worked with somebody like that? Yeah. Yeah. I was working with a man that was clearly evil, nasty, and bad. And one of my favorite hobbies was complaining about that man. <clears throat> how many have ever heard somebody complain about somebody actually your pleasure in their voice? Yeah. That was me. I'd go to Coburg, you aren't going to believe what he did today. I don't know how he put up with him, do you? Ugh. Not only that, I would take him home the night. Brenda, let me tell you today, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> One night, I was in my home. I was in the middle of an amazing pleasure roll and how evil he was and what a burden he was on my existence, having a great time. <laughs> and a friend, my, a friend of mine was at my home, and he said, he said, Jim, he said, maybe it's your perspective. I said, what? He said, Jim, when you go to work tomorrow, I want you to find people that like this man in order to challenge your perspective. I said, no. <laughs> I, I wouldn't like them either. You see, they have bad taste. Now, was I interested in having a better working relationship with that man? What was I interested in? Being right. Now, how many of you do like to be right? <laughs> yes. I've never met anybody wasting the point. Of, you know what I'd like today? To be wrong. What a rush that would be. <laughs> but how many of you know somebody who'd rather be right than happy? Would rather be right than successful? It is a strong, intrinsic drive, and I promise you, you'll never lose that drive. But I think as human beings, our challenge is to be right about the right things to find that working context. I do a lot of coaching with executives, and I've never asked them if they can justify their perspective, because I know they can. 
I ask them simply, is your present perspective getting you the quality of life you want? Is it getting you the results you want? To me, that's the main question we should ask any of ourselves. I mean, how many know somebody, no matter what good happens to them, they can find the bad in it? See, because whatever that context is, we start to gather that evidence. So <clears throat> we have reality, then we have filtered reality, and this context sets up our behaviors. Let's say I, I leave here today after my talk, and my wife comes up to me and says, we're going to a party tonight. Let's say my first thought was I'd rather eat broken glass <laughs> than to go to that party. So I have my context set. <laughs> So I go into that party with that context. So what do you think, what behavior do you think I'd be having at that party? Yeah, what I tend to do is I withdraw. I go back with the dips, uh, the food. Sit back and go, I can't believe I'm here. <sighs> now, if I hang out with anybody at that party, who do you think I'm going to hang out with? People just like me. We'll stand together. I can't believe we're here. <laughs> Look at those people jumping around. <laughs> They are so shallow. <laughs> so what kind of result do you think I'll have? And who's the first person I'm going to tell? My wife. <laughs> I think what happens is we go into self-fulfilling prophecy. And I wish we did that consciously. I think we rarely do. I think we're so busy gathering evidence and taking in what we believe is reality that we don't stop to think where it's headed. I mean, just listen to a political talk. You can watch the same speaker. One person says evil, one person says godlike. <laughs> same talk. So my problem is I was a nervous person. Actually, that wasn't my problem. That was my reality. <laughs> my problem was I saw it as not effective. So I think my challenge was Given I am nervous, how can I be effective? And I think the problem is we don't want the truth to be the truth. We don't want reality to be reality. We want some made up fantasy to be true. So, armed with this new life lesson, I got up on stage the next time and I was still nervous. I still shook during my presentation. The only difference was at the end of my talk, I said to the audience, you must know this is a good product or I would never put myself through what you just got me, saw me go through. <laughs> <laughs> they had the highest signups in the history of that company. Did I look good? No. Was I on a foundation that was real? Yes. Which brings me to my third lesson. How many of you have a nice yard or garden and you are the primary caretaker. Okay, 12 of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not part of that group either. But in the house I lived in before the one I'm in now, I lived there for nine years. My neighbor had a perfect yard. In the nine years I lived there, I never saw weed in his yard. And you know in the arboretums where they have those perfectly sculpted hedges, he had those. I was talking to a good friend of mine. I was admiring my neighbor's yard, and I said to my friend, I said, I wish I had his yard. And he looked at me and said, you know, Jim, if you had his yard, in about six months it would look like your yard. <laughs> he, said, he said, he does something to his yard you don't do to your yard. I got an insight. <laughs> See, I wanted the yard without the work. Now, what's the likelihood of that? You can easily look, look that up in the dictionary under fat chance. <laughs> but <clears throat> I hear that all the time. I want a physically fit body without diet and exercise. I want a good relationship without having to spend any time with them. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and I wanted to be a good public speaker without experience and practice. So my third is you got to do the work. You have to do the work necessary to get the results you want. And I think that sounds a lot like common sense. I was teaching a, a course about six months ago, 
And a man said, I was talking about that, and he said, Jim, isn't that common sense? I said, yeah, it is common sense. And then he said, it's amazing how uncommon common sense is. <laughs> so I think what works in life, and this is regardless if I'm teaching presentation skills courses to other introverts, or I'm doing corporate training, or I'm just having a conversation with my wife or daughter, I believe what works in life is, number one, embrace reality, not what should be, but what is. Second is to find a context that works that will point me towards the results I want. And last is to make sure you do the work. Thank you.